between 11 o'clock and midnight, we actually had a member of the FBI in the, the office uh, who came in, to, uh, came in, introduced himself to me and sat down and, uh, and just sat there most of the night, observing what was happening. The local police force, Dumfries and Gallery, uh, they were concerned at the swarms of Americans siddling with bodies and, shall we say, tampering with those things that the police were carefully checking themselves. But I'm not pretending that they said they are from the FBI or the CIA. Uh, they were just Americans who seemed to have arrived extremely quickly on the scene. I was asked to go to various locations in and around Lockerbie to look for bodies. At first it was in the early hours of the morning in very high winds, about 30 or 40 miles per hour ground level. When we'd uh, gone down one large field and identified about 10 bodies, we thought we ought to retrace our steps and put some form of identification on them. And so uh, the only thing I had with me was a, a, a block of small white labels and 100 or so plastic gloves which I carried at all times as part of my usual police search and duties. And so we, well, I put a code in every one, DCF being my initials, DCF1, right through to 58 or the bodies in that particular sector. I learned later that when the bodies were taken to the mortuary, all the labels which I had put on them had been removed, with the exception of two. And those two labels were identified on photographs later on. But for all the rest, every other one had been removed and disregarded. Very strange people popped out the woodwork very early on. Within a matter of three hours, there were American accents heard in the town. Over that night, there were large numbers, by which I mean 20, 25, 30 people, arrived. The next day, uh, as somebody commented at the time, that subtle, there was a whole bevy of uh, people walked down the main street with blue wind cheaters and baseball hats with FBI on them. But there were a lot of other Americans in the town over the first 12 hours that weren't wearing FBI wind cheaters. I don't know who they are. I know who some of them were. They certainly weren't tourists. In the morning, when more cameras have arrived, it is the turn of the dignitaries, a junior prince, and the prime minister herself. There are bits and pieces of the aircraft, and I've spoken to an accident investigator whose first impressions were absolutely stunned, and he'd never come across something quite as big as this afterwards. I've also been up to the hill to see the cockpit area and that I think is uh, a high priority to the investigators to uh, see if they can find anything from there. It's very moving indeed because there are a lot of personal possessions that you can see scattered about. Speculation is not evidence and they are systematically obtaining the evidence and systematically searching the hills around for further people and evidence. I suppose that statistically something like this has got to happen at some stage on a town. It is most sad and unfortunate that it's had to happen to lock a bit and of course so close to Christmas. The mountain rescue teams with dogs from Treece, North and South Yorkshire, Cumbria were the first to scour the terrain. Members of rescue teams on the site within two hours found Americans already there. The police and military are still prohibited by the British Official Secrets Act from speaking. This helicopter was flying, overflying the area, and uh, a chap who was looking at it had me out of a telescopic sight of a rifle, which is a, you know, probably some secret service man or other. It was a white, white unmarked helicopter. It's all intended for purpose of a civilian helicopter. I must have had an opening door, and he sat in the doorway, just scanning the landscape with his telescopic sight on the rifle. Those helicopters landed just even behind me in the field. They were landed quite regular. In fact, I was annoyed when landed in the, <clears throat> a tiny wee paddock in front of the house. Ah, there was, there was constant, there was every day. For days and end, there was flying over. It was thought that it was very odd and strange that so many people uh, should be involved in moving bodies, uh, looking at luggage, uh, who were not members of the investigating force. What were they looking for so carefully? 
you know, this was not just uh, searching desperately uh, for loved ones. It was far more than that. It was careful examination of baggage and indeed bodies. Later on, there was some Americans. I was speaking to them on top of the hill. I was checking my sheep on the hill at the time and asked us not to go up near this wee wood on the top because so I just presumed they were looking for something. But uh, I had just steered clear of the way. I heard a story about two suitcases full of money on the plane, but of course I didn't see anything. <laughs> Well, the cockpit was uh, like the head of some mortally wounded bird. It was instantly recognizable as a cockpit. And as daylight broke on the first full day of the disaster, the bodies were in an arc right round the, the hills that formed the sort of amphitheater here. And they were well spread out. It was soft ground. A lot of them had made indentations. And even a year afterwards, the animals wouldn't graze where the bodies had landed. It was as if they knew that something very terrible and yet very sacred had happened there. I rang up um, a number of times and said who I was. And eventually I established a good relationship over the telephone with one of the doctors who was doing the post-mortems. And um, it was he who arranged for me to see her body, I think very much counter to the instructions he'd been given. But um, he undertook to have the body put somewhere where I could see it, identify it. And he was extremely kind to me when I, when I went in to see the body. Uh, uh, one thing I wanted was a lock of hair, and uh, again, it's one of those vivid memories. How he went away and got a pair of scissors, got me a lock of hair. There was no official announcement. The first seven bodies were released to be taken by road south to London for onward transportation to the relatives. And I'll never forget it. All of a sudden, the main street in Lockerbie was full of people. They were standing three deep on the pavement. Not a word was said. They stood quietly to bid farewell, to pay their respect to seven dead victims. And as I say, it was one of the most moving things I've ever seen in 40 odd years. It was, it was very beautiful and it was proper. We got a message, I think about six o'clock that night to say that the first bodies were being taken out of the town. Um, about eight o'clock, so if we possible, could we go down the street to show our respect? So there was a lot of people, I don't really don't maybe two or three hundred of the locals lined the streets, and when the first lorry came round the town hall with the bodies in it, it was really very, very upsetting. To see.